Let's begin with a chant. This is, I will sing thy name, a chant of Yogananda's. But let's chant this with a, as a little bit of an exercise in attunement, um, because this is one we've probably all chanted many times before. But let's imagine, how would Yogananda chant this chant? Not only how would he sing it, with what inflections, with what attention, with what devotions, but let's try and tune into attuning our heart to how his heart would probably feel when he would chant this chant. And let's try and, just like when you tune an instrument's pitch, you can actually measure the sound wave. And you can see when one sound wave is out of tune with another because their graphs don't align. And so let's imagine that Yogananda's consciousness is like a sound graph. And our job is by sensitive attunement, by listening attentively, to see if we can feel for his sound wave and ours and then by our conscious attention and aspiration, learn to match ours a little more closely to his through this chant. visualize the vibration of our heart as a ray of light and let's offer our heart's light upwards to the spiritual eye and there visualizing Yogananda let's offer our heart's vibration at his feet asking for him to attune our consciousness to his divine consciousness, to attune our hearts to his love, our minds to his wisdom, our souls to his joy.
And now keeping your eyes closed, let's listen to this Whispers from Eternity as the natural result of this attunement. I attuned my life with thine. Now my life has become a long, unbroken inspiration. Thy fountain of bliss refreshes and delights me night and day, whether I be wakeful, fast asleep, or dreaming fondly of thee. Oh, what has become of me? Delight, an overwhelming delight, endless, indescribable thrills of divine delight spray unceasingly over me. O oh, aged nectar, wine of centuries, I found thee at last and will taste of thy sweetness forever, forever, forever. This is Whispers from Eternity, number 199, Endless Thrills of Delight. I decided to choose this one this week because it's such a juxtaposition to, you know, some of the more intense prayers that I've taken in the last 12 weeks, uh, from Divine Ma Mother dancing her war dance to being reforged in the crucible of God's love. Um, but now I thought it would be really fun to focus on this prayer, endless thrills of delight, because this is dangling out to us the carrot of the spiritual path to say that this is the result, almost more than any other prayer. This one really struck me that it is like a, if you do this, you will get that um, sort of statement from Master is what it reads like to me, because the very first sentence is like a yoga sutra in and of itself. <laughs> I attuned my life with thine, full stop, period. No explanations, just that's it. I attuned my life with thine. And that process of attuning your life with your gurus or with God is the spiritual path. So this is no small statement. But I sort of, it re is reminiscent to me of now we come to the study of yoga, except for this is, now I have attuned my life with thine. So all of that, all, that, all those practices, all those techniques, all that aspiration, all that devotion has brought me to this one moment of really feeling my attunement with my guru or with God. And then, now my life has become a long, unbroken inspiration. Just think about that. I mean, I, I often repeat myself when looking at these prayer demands because it's so easy to read them as merely words or as wishful aspiration, but read this as a divine promise that this could be your state of consciousness, that thy fountain of bliss refreshes and delights me night and day, whether I be wakeful, fast asleep, or dreaming fondly of thee. Doesn't that sound wonderful? One of my favorite lines in one of my favorite chants of Yogananda's Desire My Great Enemy, it says, Night and day in thy joy, O my Lord. And when I chant that line over and over and go very deeply into it and offer my heart in attunement, and I can begin to imagine what that would truly feel like, everything else just melts away. Why would, how could you possibly desire anything else then God's bliss night and day in thy joy, O oh my Lord. And obviously, if we all could just realize that, we'd be free. But we have all these layers of misconceptions and delusions that have been, you know, coded over our consciousness, over incarnations of error. And so it's not as easy as simply saying that truth to then believe that truth, but we can affirm it. And we can take steps towards tasting it and experiencing it. And we can remind ourselves that this bliss is truly what we're seeking. And it is achievable. It is attainable. Not that I have achieved it and that I can add my attestations to those that have come before me. But Swami talked about this. And I have every reason in the world to believe him that he says he is in a constant state of bliss 
that doesn't matter whether he's waking or sleeping. He feels engrossed in that sense of God's joy. What an incredible statement. What an incredible promise. I have fluctuations throughout my waking day when I have the ally of my will and the good company of all these great souls in our community. And still my consciousness will go through ups and downs. In fact, just yesterday, I felt myself assaulted by this terrible, tamasic drive or, or lethargy. And it was just pulling my consciousness and my energy, my vibration down. And I had to use a lot of willpower to just push my way through it. And actually it was in some satsang with friends and using my will that suddenly I began to feel rejuvenated. And I woke up this morning and I felt intuitively that in some capacity it had been a test from Satan to see if I could, with, see if I could overcome that invitation to lethargy and tamas. But on the other side of that, we have this constant invitation to be in a fountain of bliss, refreshing us and delighting us night and day. And that sounds pretty good to me, basically. And you know what's interesting? We have to be honest about our motivations in life. We have to be self-honest that, you know, it's like Dharmarajan very humorously said once that when he chants the chant, I want only thee, Lord, thee, only thee that there's a little voice in the back of his head that says, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> you just know that's not quite true yet. But we can make the affirmation. We can say, I know that ultimately all I want is you. Ultimately, the bliss I'm seeking in everything in my life is just a reflection of your wonderment. And this is very useful when we can get down to a deeper understanding of this motivation within us. I, when I was younger and more of a rascal and, you know, sought out happiness, fulfillment and experience in less healthy ways than I do now, um, it was easy to find very uh, intense, emotionally fulfilling experiences in the short term. But what I began to realize was for every up of the material world, of course, there was a concomitant crash. And that crash usually hurt more than the up did. And that the more I took advantage of that capability, the trend was a downward one, that the peaks got lower and the valleys got deeper. And I, but I suddenly realized by the grace of God that through meditation and through devotion and through discipleship, I suddenly discovered that those peaks became higher but that they were no longer brought by external stimulants, but that they were brought by an inner experience of my own nature and of divinity, of God, of devotion, of love. And that then the valleys began to even out. And my friends at the time, I was in high school, couldn't understand my motivations, couldn't understand the sudden change in my behavior. And they thought I had become like religiously uh, fundamental, which I suppose maybe in a way I had. But I told them, I said, my motivation is exactly the same as it was six months ago. I am still seeking maximum amount of bliss and I'm trying to optimize my sense of pleasure in my life and I'm trying to avoid as much pain and discomfort as I possibly can. <laughs> but where I'm pursuing those ends has changed. And I was talking with some friends and they said, you know, why do you like to meditate? And I told them, I said, listen, all those experiences that you're seeking through your extracurricular activities, I'm experiencing those in a different way in my meditation. I wouldn't meditate if I didn't enjoy it. I wouldn't pursue God if it wasn't blissful, if it wasn't wonderful, if it wasn't an endless thrill of inspiration. And so all I mean to say by this is it's useful to remind ourselves why we're doing this in a positive context and to remind ourselves of the joy we feel in meditation and to rejuvenate that appreciation and that love romance with God as joy. So I'll take another read through this. I attuned my life with thine. Now my life has become a long, unbroken inspiration 
Thy fountain of bliss refreshes and delights me night and day, whether I be wakeful, fast asleep, or dreaming fondly of thee. Oh, what has become of me? Isn't that such a delightful line? That bliss is so transformative, we won't even recognize ourselves. That's what Yogananda said. I would, I'd love to contemplate that line. Oh, what has become of me? That in the presence of so much overwhelming delight, that we change and we become something other than we thought we were. Oh, what has become of me? Delight, an overwhelming delight endless, indescribable thrills of divine delight spray unceasingly over me. This is a wonderful visualization to take. Often I've discovered that what brings me suffering in my life is this delusional thought that I'm alone and that I, I am leading my life, you know, as a lone warrior, trying valiantly but uh, hopelessly to overcome and usually I feel a sense of hope and a sense of relaxation and a sense of joy when I remember that God is always with me and that not only God, but all of my great soul friends on this spiritual path and that we're all moving towards that goal together and ever supported with one another. And um, this sentence, endless indescribable thrills of divine delight spray unceasingly over me is a wonderful reminder to us that when he says unceasingly, he means unceasingly. <laughs> and that the only requisite for our awareness of that is ourselves, is that we have to be in tune to realize that God is constantly showering us with his grace, with his blessings. Just the other day I was talking about I was talking with a friend of mine about another friend of mine who very clearly has deep spiritual psalm scars and deep blessings from past lives that like God and the masters are watching over this person as they traverse their life. And the funny thing is, is they don't realize how blessed they are. They don't realize that they think they've walked through life alone, but little do they know that there's been an army of angels protecting them and that every step in their entire incarnation has been blessed and has been prepared by the masters. And they just don't recognize it yet. But in fact, that grace has always been present. And it's easy for me to see because I can recognize the grace of my guru when I see it. And so it's easy to recognize in this other person's life. But the only thing that keeps them from it is this attunement to recognize. It's not that they need to go find God's grace. It's just they need to wake up and remember that, oh my God, it's been with me all the time. Oh, aged nectar, wine of centuries, I found thee at last and will taste of thy sweetness forever, forever, forever. I don't really know what else to add to that other than let's hold that sweetness in our hearts and let's remember to keep directing our consciousness to that. And whenever in our lives we're not experiencing that divine sweetness, something's wrong and that we need to get back in tune with God, with Guru and with that divine mother. Um, and it takes practice. I'm not saying that I've perfected this, not in the slightest, but I've been taking Yogananda's chant, Thou art my life, Thou art my love, Thou art the sweetness which I do seek. And Yogananda said that chant was specifically to cultivate sweetness in your consciousness. And I heard a funny Indian saying once that they say, eat sweet, be sweet. But, so we could say, eat the sweetness of God and be the sweetness of God. And when you taste of that sweetness forever, forever, forever. What else are we looking for but that sweetness and that kindness? And it's so easy, I, I was about to say it's so easy for us in America, but maybe I'll correct myself and say it's so easy for me in America to get caught up in thinking that life is defined by achievements or success or outer abilities. But it's not. 
It's determined by your inner quality of bliss and your happiness. And that ultimately that bliss and that happiness will actually give you the power to achieve in the world, if that's your, if that's your dharma, that it will give you the inspiration, the motivation, the energy, the vitality to do that which you need to do. Versus if you feel no joy and no sweetness and no support in your life, you have to bring out a bullwhip just to get yourself out of bed. But if you feel love, if you feel sweetness, if you feel inflated, like blessed by God's love, then it's easy to do anything. Because what else would you rather be doing? Where else would you rather be? You already have that which you're seeking. So I'll just read this prayer one more time. And I invite us all, let's, let's just take this as a deep visualization and imagination of what your soul potential is. And I invite you to let your imagination run wild. When he says, uh, fountains of bliss, you know, imagine the biggest uh, Yellowstone National Park uh, status geysers of bursting bliss in your soul, spraying light and sparkling joy across the cosmos of your awareness. And be as grand as you can and just try to imagine what could this really be? And then through that, see if we can take just one step closer to that awareness. And the other thing is, I learned this trick when I was training as an actor in Los Angeles, try to remove any blockages between your willingness or between yourself and your willingness to accept a new reality. Meaning that when you say these words, try to totally override that little part of your brain that says, not really, or that resists a new consciousness. And just throw yourself in with complete enthusiasm, with faith, with childlike wonderment. And just for the next minute and a half, imagine that this is your new state of consciousness, that this is who you are. And let's see what happens. So let's close our eyes and let's gaze up at the spiritual eye for a moment. And again, let's offer our heart's feelings, our mind, our vibration up to the Guru, attuning our vibration to his vibration, and by so doing, opening ourselves to his tremendous downpouring of grace. And now you can pray along with me. I attuned my life with thine. Now my life has become a long, unbroken inspiration. Thy fountain of bliss refreshes and delights me night and day, whether I be wakeful, fast asleep, or dreaming fondly of thee. Oh, what has become of me? Delight on overwhelming delight, Endless, indescribable thrills of divine delight spray unceasingly over me. O oh, aged nectar, wine of centuries, I found thee at last, and I will taste of thy sweetness forever, forever, forever. Om peace. This is a very short prayer demand. This is easily memorized. It's just eight or 10 sentences long. But just imagine, what could this prayer do if you memorized it and you practiced it every day? Or if you practiced it at every meal? Or at every moment that you changed activities at work, that you focused on a new project? What could it do to you to just remind yourself, when I attune my life with thine, this is what happens. This will be the reward. I really encourage you all, if you're watching this, to take these whispers from eternity as like a spiritual recipe that if you follow it, it will yield a specific predictable result. And so I would encourage you, because I've done it this week and it was really wonderful, take up this prayer demand. 
maybe just for one week, practice it morning and night and see how it changes your consciousness, see how it changes your awareness of bliss, see how it changes your motivation for what you're seeking behind all of your activity. And maybe day by day, prayer by prayer, feeling by feeling, Master will be able to come into our consciousness and rewire our brains until at last we can say truthfully, I want only thee, Lord, thee, only thee. So let's end with a chant together and let's Chant that chant, I want only thee, Lord. I want only thee, Lord, thee, only thee. I want only thee, Lord, thee, only thee. I want only thee, Lord, thee, only thee. I want only thee. I want only thee, Lord, thee, 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 only thee. I want only thee. I want only thee, Lord, thee, 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 only thee. I want only thee. I want only thee, Lord, thee, only thee. I want only thee, Lord, thee, only thee. I want only thee, Lord, thee, only thee. I want only.